This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 080. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. As always, Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Jonathan Light. How are you doing today, Jonathan? I'm doing well, Mikey. Feels laid back today. Looking forward to this conversation. But even that intro, it was calm mic. Hum. Okay, well, I like it. Well, it is going to be a fun one, I think. I like our topic here. We're diving into responding to unsolicited veterinary advice. So all of the requests via social media, text message, at the grocery store, when you're at the gym trying to work out, when people pop their head in the shower while you're showering and ask you a vet question, it seems like it never ends. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. And then we can take that operationally into the vet clinic on some experience, both from an employer and an employee standpoint, and how you deal with that or how you try and deal with that, especially in this connected age. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. I haven't officially, you know, been practicing as a veterinarian in over three years, and I still get a reasonably large amount of requests. And it always blows Rosalie's mind. Like she's, she'll be like, how, how do people still reach out to you? Like it's sometimes it's on social media or text, or sometimes we're even out and they'll be like, Oh, I got a quick vet question for you. And she's just like, this is insane. Once you've got that veterinary, even as a student, I would imagine that once they know you're in, it's like, it's free advice time. Absolutely. Okay. And so, we are our own worst nightmares without a doubt, but okay, that's before, our conversation. Before for we dive into the, I guess the episode at hand, um, yeah. what's happening in your world. You said in our little pre, you said you're heading back to Fernie again. And I, I guess it ties to the episode. Cause you were, you were chuckling. You're like, it's just for, for a hockey tournament. So there'll be no vet people there. I won't have to like give out any vet advice or anything like that. But so yeah, Candace and I, we were excited. We were talking about it yesterday actually. And saying we are overdue for some social time with a different group. So we used to get together pre COVID. We had a Frisbee group that we were together with and, and a good little, um, probably a group of 10 to 12 people. While that totally disappeared in time of COVID virtually, we'd still get together, but it has been a lot less. We're both feeling that we need that back in our lives. We've got our first traveling uh, tournament this weekend. My little one is six years old. We're getting together with parents that we don't know well. We've been getting to know them a little bit during this time of COVID over the last year and could not be more excited. Those kids are going to get on the slides. We're going to have a couple of drinks. Like, let's have some fun. It is very much overdue. So that's happening this weekend. Excited for it. Nice. Good for you. And you are, you are an extrovert for sure. So this is like lifeblood in your veins. I was feeling as we can say we're playing some cards and I'm going, I'm feeling drained. And yet great things have been happening with work. There's ups and downs without a doubt, but what am I missing? And literally that social, con that social component for me is missing right now. And it's, it's just part of the, part of the different uh, juggling acts that you have to have, especially with a four and six year old, right? We have lots of responsibilities running businesses, lots of responsibilities. That still means that you have to fill those other buckets, which you know better than I do. I guess so. I mean, I feel like I've been kind of cooped up as well. So I'm heading off to Florida. I guess at the time of this recording, I don't know when this episode's coming out, but I'm heading out next week down to Florida to meet up with my Monday night uh, group of guys that we kind of mastermind accountability partner with. Um, and it'll you're be picking up on a oligarch yacht, if I heard correct. <laughs> well, the size of the boat is to be determined. But yeah, the, the plan for the Friday is to get on a boat enjoy the sunshine, have some drinks. So I'm looking forward to it. Obviously up here in Saskatoon, it is still very much winter. So Dude, 
Get I'm totally the- putting you on the spot because in our pre-recording, you were talking about a possibility for afterwards of abstaining for a few months from alcohol. Show the listeners the book that you're reading right now with your accountability group. It's pretty cool. Okay. Well, I'm totally putting you on the spot. Yeah. But oh, I no, that's all good, man. Relevant. Quick, quick tangent. Super relevant. Quick tangent. So with the accountability group, we're going through the big leap right now. So it's by Gay Hendricks. Uh, lots of great stuff in this book. The Cole's note of what I was mentioning to Jonathan is he talks about upper limiting yourself. So when you're having success, when you're reaching kind of new heights, you will reset to your comfort zones, right? Like, and there'll be an internal dialogue of some sort, like maybe you don't deserve the success you're having or you're not worthy of it or whatever that is. And so I was reflecting on how do I upper limit myself? And one of the things I concluded was if Rosalie and I are going to celebrate or if I'm going to celebrate, it will probably involve alcohol, right? It will be a bottle of champagne or let's go out for dinner and drinks And so I'm just going to try on, excuse me, for a while, what it's like removing alcohol. So I don't know, I I guess I just picked six months. So this is, here's the asterisk after the Florida trip, because I will be drinking on the, uh, the boat in Florida and possibly the virtual poker trip or poker as well. I don't know. You got to draw a line in the sand somewhere. So I said, when I get back from Florida, I'm taking, you know, six months to just eliminate that as a possibility of where I'm upper limiting myself. And then just seeing this isn't a big like, I'm done drinking forever. This is just remove it for six months. And then I'll analyze the game film, see, see what happened. So that's the plan with that. Cool plan. Well, I think we should analyze it on the fly on the veterinary project. So I'll bring it up in the coming months and see where you're at with it. Do that. That's good. Now I got see, this is excellent, because now I have like extreme accountability completely because i've just i will put you on the spot now i can't not do it so okay cool on with the show okay well today get to the fun for if you are a second or first year vet student maybe even getting to vet school the second the public world knows that you are moving into veterinary medicine what happens my dog is sick what should i do about the diarrhea my favorite that is, are that the is ones, really bad, bad voice, but it oh, does yeah. happen. <laughs> My favorite are the ones that come from people that you haven't heard from, seen, talked to in like decades. And it's like, oh, hey, remember me from 25 years ago? I got a question for you. And you're like, oh, man, here it goes. So, <laughs> so we thought this would be a great topic of conversation because one, it's fun. Two, it's real. And three, Maybe there's some tactics to try and help with this and or take Mike's and mine's bad advice about what we've done in the past. Well, and that's the the (laughs) best part of this episode is normally we try to have a punchline where we're like, try this. And I was like, man, I don't have great advice on this one. This is going to be like, use the community to get advice. Um, The other thing I'm thinking of is the the funny ways we get around it like when you you know what do you say you do for work when you're at an event so that you don't have to tell people you're a veterinarian which is like sort of a hidden joke in the veterinary world it is so true when i'm on a flight i will very rarely if ever say i'm a veterinarian because you are stuck in that seat you're stuck in that conversation you're stuck the duration of the flight answering questions about whoever's sitting beside you's dog without a doubt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive in here, Jonathan. You obviously have more experience operationally. So when we look at this, you know, as someone who has managed multiple veterinary clinics, I guess where where do we jump off? How do you manage the flow of communication where you know you've got people? Obviously, you want your clients to reach out to the vet clinic. That's what you're there for. But how do you funnel it through the right channels? I'm going to start this with a story. Back in late 2016, way back in the day, we were making a transition of software at one of the clinics. And this was a clinic that I managed. It had 18 doctors at the time. And we were working through the clinic software transition. We had a doctor's meeting. And then a doctor's meeting, I was really excited because we had new uh, professional business cards being made. And as part of that transition for those business cards, we got to put emails, addresses on there and phone numbers on there. 
in that meeting, I have never been more blindsided, shocked, and absolutely at the end of the day, completely found wrong when I stated that we were going to be putting all of your personal email addresses on there for the clinic. So not even their personal, like their, their, their personal, personal ones, but the clinic email address specifically for them and ask whether they wanted their cell numbers on there. Holy shit. Did I hear about it? I cannot, I will remember that meeting for the rest of my life because doctors with one year of experience to 30 years experience literally looked at me like I was an idiot, looked at me going, are you not a veterinarian? Do you not know what you are setting up for? And it quickly, quickly turned into, there's not a chance in hell we will be putting our email addresses nor our personal cell phones onto those business cards. So Jonathan, you can do whatever you want, but that's not happening. I like it. Okay, so let's dive in. Because So listening to that, I completely agree with them on cell phone number. Yep. Like on, on that one, I'm laughing where I'm like, I can't believe you suggested that. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I really don't. Yeah. I thought I was being really connected and that's what they would want. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. The, the clinic email, I could see that if they have their own dedicated, like, you know, Jonathan at whatever the veterinary clinic name is, obviously not your personal email. So so where did you guys land? Nothing. What did you put on the business oh, no, cards? No. no, no, no. We made us a general email box where those client emails ended up in that somebody was responsible for then funneling to the individual doctors at that time. Software has since expanded where you can do better than that. But our doctors at that point, which is very fair because of the volume of traffic coming their way, advice questions, secondary questions, you name it, uh, lab, et cetera. They're going, Jonathan, we can't keep up with that. We can barely keep up with our medical notes. We can barely keep up with the callbacks, the reminders, everything else that we have to do. You then make us look at that email address over and over again. It's going to be really hard. Yeah, that's fair. That makes and way more a, sense. It was a fair comment. And yeah. so we actually ended up just making a generalized doctor's email box. Yeah. I, now that I think about it, I think my email would have only gone out to my clients. Like when it's like, you know, yep. here's blood results, here's follow-up directions. Exactly. That's right. Your trust, everything else along that line. So from an operation standpoint, uh, what I see now in, in this day and age is more to what you've described. Depending on the relationship you have with that client is where, whether you have personal numbers actually going out or not. Literally, even for myself, you know, callbacks right now, I try and block my phone when possible, but then people don't answer back. And then they'll phone the clinic getting mad that I'm not phoning them. So eventually after the fourth time, I'm like, screw it, take the block phone off and just make the phone call. That's, that's what 2022 looks like right now, because there's many times that I'm actually not at the clinic to make that phone call. Yeah. And it, cause that's your personal phone. That's my personal phone. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do you give, or have you given out your personal phone number to clients? Yes. Okay. And is that like a rare exception or often? Rare exception. Okay. That was, that was me you? too. Like I would cringe if someone was like, can I get your personal number? And then you're kind of scrambling on how to answer. Cause I really never wanted to, cause you know, you're going to get bombarded. Yeah. I have worked with vets though, that readily give out their personal number. I like, it would happen almost all the time. And I was like, how are you doing this? You're going to get slammed. It's a problem we have. So my mixed animal world, uh, it's more common. It's something that I've learned over the last two years and that it is more common. And, and you, you started off in that world. I, this is new to me, but it's more common for those veterinarians while they're on the road to be answering personal questions and personal calls. And we talked about this in the pre-recording. It's also a way for clients sometimes when they don't get the right answer from the clinic, well, I'm just going to call the vet's personal phone number and get the answer that I want, i.e. the mom and dad dilemma. Well, we're seeing that play out in mixed animal practice right now. Okay. So how do you, how do you handle that if mom or dad says no and they run to ask the other person? First off, mom and dad have to be on the same page. <laughs> so if mom's saying one thing and dad's saying the other, it doesn't work out well. And this comes down to communication. Let's have the meetings, talk about it as a group, what's acceptable and what's not. But then once that's put into place, it takes a long time. 
So in some of the clinics we purchased, this is 20, 30 years in the making. I kid you not, it's decades of different doctors giving their access to their phones. It does not happen overnight. And then when you tell a client, no, please call the clinic and they'll schedule you in. What do you mean? We've had access to Dr. X and X for the last 20 years and now you're blocking us? Oh, corporate, that's horrible. I can't believe that. It has nothing to do with corporate. It has an ability and a, a, a desire to keep that doctor's sanity in check. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but someone who listens to this podcast regularly was, was telling me that they get most of their phone calls at dinner time, like when they're sitting down with their family, because their clients know that's when they're finally actually at home and available. And he, let's, let's go into that. Cause we talked about this in the pre-recording. What do you do with that? Well, you that's, I mean, like, you've got to set boundaries and it's, this is one of those things where it's, it's easier to, to say and harder to do, but I, I mean, let's, okay. Let's introduce a quick tangent here. And I, this isn't meant to be like too deep, but what is the obligation to respond to someone? Right. It's so hard. It is so hard. I have friends that sometimes won't respond in a day. And I'm like, oh, those jerks they are not came back to me. But then they do that for six months, a year, as you get to know them more. And you're like, no, that's just them. And then you don't yeah. feel like they're assholes. I'm kind of one of those jerks sometimes. Like I've like, yeah, but I know if you're in a different, <sighs> you've actually told me hours that you're not available. And I'm like, awesome. I'm going to text you. And I could care less whether I hear back from you by the next day. Well, let's, let's dive in. And just for the listener, what I am specifically talking about right here is a client reaching out via social media or your personal phone and leaving you a message of some sort. Because this that's totally different than calling the business clinic line and leaving a voicemail yep. or the clinic email and leaving an email. Because then I feel like you right. have an obligation to respond. I agree. Okay. But personally, yep. if someone reaches out. So I've been following on social media, um, a guy that kind of dives into this. So this example is credit to him. I, his name is Alex Hormozzi. I hope I'm saying that right. But I'll run through his example with you, Jonathan. Yeah. He says... Imagine if today you got 500,000 text messages from clients and they all just said, had one quick question for you. What would you do with that? I would probably respond to the people I knew well and know that I'm screwed either way. Okay. So it's inter that's interesting choice of words, screwed either way, yeah. right? So where and, he, and here's I'm I, like again I'm swearing more than normal on this episode, but that's how I feel, and I can even feel my chest tightening up on that because I want to help them, I want to be able to get them next steps with their animal, whatever's going on, and you can sometimes feel that frustration coming through the text or voice or whatever it is on social that you receive. Yeah, and I get it. I mean that's fair, and as veterinarians we want to help, and you know you can you can see that like someone reaches out and that's what they're looking for. But where, where Alex takes this is it's physically impossible for you to respond to 500,000 people. So yep. take off the few you did respond to. Let's look at whoever you didn't respond to. And it's like his argument is it's all about whatever meaning you attach to that, right? Because there's no barrier of entry. Like someone can track me down on Facebook and send me a message. And now it's in my inbox, right? Like that's totally unsolicited. Why? Why does it fall on me to meet their request? So interesting you mentioned that, Mike. And I'm thinking this on the fly because on LinkedIn, that happens to me quite a bit. Somebody will, will click to connect and then they'll have a follow-up email loop that says, oh, I want to talk to you about XYZ service or what we can do for your companies, et cetera. And I click ignore and I move on with my life and I feel no responsibility to get back to them. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. It's like in that situation, you're attaching a different meaning to, to the message that came in and then how you respond to it. Yep. Right. So there's obviously like, we're feeling a, a, a bit of a sense of obligation as yeah. veterinarians that if there's an animal involved, you know, and, and uh, perhaps it's like, I don't want that animal to suffer yes. and which is totally valid, but it's really not fair for other people to put us in that position. And yet, are we putting ourselves in that position by responding to that call? And therefore, 
then making ourselves. So this happened to me in the last month. And I redirected back to the clinic of primary, where their primary caregiver was. And then they had follow-up questions. So then therefore, I then followed up with the primary caregiver doctor, of which I had never had a talk about with another case, but we then got onto the phone twice more in the preceding two weeks. Because I did have an obligation. You mentioned it earlier. There was good value back and forth. It's a relationship that I have with this individual. So I did feel obligated to ensure that they were looked after. Yeah. And I don't think, like, I'm not saying that's wrong. Like, this isn't... No, you know, I know. I, I, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right either, but it's just... is. I hope somebody comments back on her podcast well, that says, you're an idiot and you should have done this. I can't... I see some posts, like some people will post in various Facebook groups, you know, someone reached out, said this, this is how I responded, you know, because it happens all the time. And I know... Like for me, one of the key things is just noticing how I feel. And we were talking about this in, in the pre-recording. There's a dr dramatic difference if it's like a lifelong friend yeah. and, and, you know, we chat often and we chat 99% of the time about non-veterinary stuff and they, they add value to my life and I add value to their life and we have a great relationship. And every once in a while, they're like, hey, quick vet question. And in I, this case, that was that one. I'm going to do it every time. Yeah, Same thing. I don't, I don't like feel that like whatever, not in my stomach and that frustration and that annoyance with those conversations. It's the ones that start, Hey, how are you? And you know, you're just like, Oh man, I know exactly where this is going. Right. So with those ones, you, I feel like it is our responsibility as veterinarians to pay attention to how you yourself feel because that's going to give you a clue on what actions you need to take. And if you don't take actions on it and you just repeatedly let it happen to you, then it's your fault at that point. Like I, I understand we can't control people messaging us. I get that. But you, after that keeps happening, you can put steps in place to like direct how you want that to go. Speaking like a wise man. Well, there. I don't know because I mean, for full disclosure, my tactics on that, which, which may not be good. I'm partially embarrassed to even put it on the podcast is like, I like delay, like you, I do not owe an urgent response. Like someone else's emergency is not my emergency. And I know that can sound insensitive because there's probably a pet involved. Right. But yep. thinking about it, like, what am I going to do? Someone in a different city messages me and says whatever they say about whatever vet problem they're having. It's, it's not like I'm there to help them anyway. The answer is always go see your vet, right? Like that's their next phone call. So, I mean, to be honest, I delay, like if you've ever messaged me a vet question and you haven't heard back in five weeks, that was intentional. <laughs> I love it. So have you had anybody where you have delayed or not answered back, then try again? Uh, sometimes they'll like try to pop it to the back to like back to the top of my inbox or my mm -hmm. like social media account or whatnot. But I'm so interested to hear because you're not a full-time practicing doctor. Well, I'm, I'm not a full-time practicing doctor anymore. I'm part-time practicing doctor. I wonder what some of the responses would be from some of our podcast listeners to what they do. Well, I'm excited to hear like people might listen to that and be like, that is unethical or unprofessional. I can almost see like kind of their argument, but it's like you, you'll get buried because like you're, you're teaching people how to treat you. So the second you respond once you are now the go-to every other time. And then right. you're setting up for failure if you then delay or or don't communicate effectively to a different end the next time. Because they're yeah. going to look at you and go, well, you did it this time. And how come you're not doing it again? But potentially, right? Whereas if like, this is my sort of theory by not even engaging, they're still going to go seek like their real veterinarian's advice. Like, it's not like they're like, well, Mike didn't respond, so we're screwed. There's no other options. They're just grasping at all of the options available. I'm one of them. And it's like, call your veterinary office. Yep. But yep. Anyway, I'll end my rant on that part there.
I like it. I, I'm interested to see what people's take on this one is, but it happens every single day. Yeah. Yeah. To Absolutely. individuals out there that are listening to this without a doubt. And I was, I'm considering, sorry, this, well, this isn't part of the rant. This is something I'm considering. I haven't done. I would be very interested to know if someone else has like an auto response canned message. Like, thank you for reaching out regarding your pet. Unfortunately, like for whatever, like I'm unavailable right now, contact your veterinarian and even say in there, this is an like automated response. Cause I don't think we should feel bad about setting that boundary at all. Like, no, I, can't I think, keep we, on top I think of my- we have to, I, and again, this is in, in some of the acquisitions we do the literal, one of the first discussions that we have is around scheduling in that clinic. And if there's a doctor that is in there normally, and again, I know I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but that's in that 10 plus years of experience, especially in the mixed animal setting, we have found that our number one goal in the next year is to try and take away some of those personal messages off of their phone. Try and take some of that scheduling off of that personal doctor who's run it as either the owner or a, a main associate in that clinic and put it back onto the practice management software, put it back onto the practice team to better coordinate because right now it is all on the person's cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and it's totally different if, if you know, there's a clinic cell phone and you're channeling through that and, and you're the on-call vet, fair game. That's your job. You know, like you're responding to those. But even then, there's now alternatives. There's triage services, Animal Health Link. Again, I'm totally poster child for it. We're part owners of it. It's fantastic. There's a triage service where registered vets, techs, take on those calls as a start so that it doesn't have to be that veterinarian or that person on call that takes the first message. Because many, many times, actually about 68 to 70% of the time, it's not a true call that vet should be taken anyway. Man, you got your numbers dialed in 68 to 70% of the time. 68 to 70. We get the analytics every month. That's amazing. Well, I mean, you're totally right. Anything you can do to kind of like efficiently channel the communication. It's everything. Now you're looking at virtual receptionists and what they can do. We've had Phil, Dr. Phil Zeitzman on looking at that. Like These are the ways of the future because we need to be able to pull things off of these personal cell phones. There's too much to do. Um, also, we're talking about personal cell phones for texting. Software now. We use EasyVet in one of our practices. There's multiple other serverless software systems out there, Pet Desk, which can then move your text messaging onto a platform, which then goes directly into your medical record where it needs to live and doesn't live on your personal cell phone. A no-brainer in 2022. Man, I... I no-brainer. I glanced over at our episode like flow chart. This is a quick plug too for our next episode where we have Doug Jack coming on like lawyer extraordinaire for all things veterinarians. And he touches on medical records and where you can get in trouble. And it is you're like, so if you have one conversation living somewhere over here, not on the medical record, and then another conversation on the medical record, it's like, well, no doubt confusion ensues. And then the inefficiencies, because depending on where you live, state or province, you have to pull all those text messages into your medical file somehow, which is hours of work if a process inspection doesn't go your way. Yeah. No brainer. Okay. Okay. I want to, I'm going to throw you over more to the business side. First, I do want to say one sort of, um, I don't know if it's an asterisk or a positive, or we'll call it an observation. From my time in practice, when I communicate, most this is more so with my clients and sometimes it would be a non-client that's in a tight spot yeah when you do engage them it builds insane rapport right like well, they are agree. they well, are now your client and where i'm going with this is i'm going to throw it over to you for employer risk because you had said from a clinic standpoint there's a risk there that clients are like ultra bonded to the veterinarian and will leave the practice. And I can tell you, yes, I have moved practices within the same city, opposite sides of the city. Saskatoon's not a huge city, but still clients followed. Like they drove across an entire city. And it, those were the clients like that you engage with, help in emergencies, you know, get through tough times. So 
where do you fall on this kind of like employer risk, I guess, with these personal discussions? Great questions and observations, Mike. First point, going back to the attachment and that sense of emotional attachment, as well as real, Uh, using these new softwares uh, as a service, whether it's things like pet desk, uh, text messaging apps, those that actually facilitate into your practice management software are essential to business in 2022. Going back and forth with your clients on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, less LinkedIn, but let's call Facebook and Instagram for 2022, essential to build in your client base and also maintaining that client base once the post-pandemic wave of clients decreases a little bit. And that's what we're seeing is, is the, the, the magic ball for 23-24. We're going to have to re-engage in that manner. So on that end, there's, there's nothing better. Mm-hmm. in terms of forming that emotional bond that clients are looking for. And sorry, just to clarify that last point, kind of what you're seeing or maybe predicting or saying is currently in 2022, it's like hang your your shingle, hang your open side and you are fully booked. Yep. But as that wave, as things start to normalize 2023, 2024, there, there will come a point where, where it's more about like bonding to those clients, maintaining your clients, you know, to keep that appointment book full. That's correct. And that is not me saying it. That's not my opinion. That is what is out in the marketplace, which is already being seen right now and is expected to just to continue to grow as we look at likely 23, 24, 25 and and growing. We're going to be back into that area, especially depending on inflation, interest rates, recession, all those other key economic drivers of pet care. Second part, employers. So let's jump into that for a second here. There is risk if an employee has all of those telephone numbers on their personal cell phone. What does that look like? We have to have that conversation. It's a fair conversation to have in terms of the value of the business is attached to the clients that you have. And the clients are owned from a perspective of the database is by the clinic, not by the individual associate, unless they're an owner in that clinic. So that's a discussion that an employer is best to have with their employee as soon as possible into their tenure with that clinic. Because just as you said, clients are, for the most part, emotionally bonded to the veterinarian, to the team, not as much to the clinic. And that is regionally specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, you, you certainly don't want someone maliciously harvesting the database, you know, with the intent of, basically stealing them or pulling them away. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And those, again, earlier you have that discussion into your employee-employer relationship, the better. Okay, nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we hit on most of what we wanted to. Any Anything I missed or anywhere else you want to take this? This one's a fun conversation. It's a hard conversation. Uh, it has emotional drivers to it. I think you deal with it better than I do. You're You're able to more easily switch off your your texts, you know, when you're into your deep dives, which I super respect. Yeah. I mean, yep. maybe it's definitely come with a lot of growth because to be like very blunt, I'm a people pleaser. You know, I want people to like me. Um, I've had to really push that, you know, rock uphill to get to this place where for the most part, my cell phone is on silent and is on do not disturb. And it, yeah. it eventually happened out of just necessity because it's just there's too there's too many requests if i spend my day responding to them i will do nothing that i actually need to do or want to do to push my you know priorities forward love it so then as a final perhaps we you know have some question of introspection for our listeners whether they're in the car wherever the heck they're working out or what they're doing while they're listening at this point still what's their buttons and and what are you guys doing about it? Because it's the same question I have to ask myself sometimes. Yeah. And then last last thing I'd say is like, after you've noticed them, you got to do something about like, don't, don't keep letting it punch you in the face. We know getting Facebook messages is annoying. So it's time to put, you know, some barriers in place and some, some responses. So that, that part's up to us. Gotta hate those punches to the face. (laughs) It's metaphorical, John. Metaphorical. <laughs> I just love how strong that metaphor was. 
wasn't well, like a little, it wasn't like a little, <laughs> a, a sliver. It's a full punch to the face. Well, and I mean, okay, now we're just rambling, but sometimes it is right. Like you, you, you've had a long day. You're exhausted. You can't possibly answer any more questions. You get home, you like, whatever you slump down on the couch and you go on social media to like be entertained or distract yourself or whatever it is. And then there it is. One more vet question waiting for you from someone that doesn't give a shit about you. And it's just like, oh yeah, that's nice. Another fun episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast with Mike and Johnny. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.